One of the glories of discovering sacred rock sites is the number of tangents or diversions that present themselves. In this one, a short cab ride, or limo if you must, delivers you to a picture-perfect Anglican church in Darling Point. A sacred Sydney rock site? We'll see. There must be something warm and welcoming about Sydney because a number of international rock stars have chosen the city as places to be wed. Now, whereas Michael Jackson decided to do it in a room at an inner city hotel, Elton John was much more of a traditionalist. Elton came along to St Mark's Church here in Darling Point. He had a bride in white, he had confetti and he had guests. My, did he have guests. He had Olivia Newton-John and Michael Parkinson and Barry Hunt and one of the largest media scrums ever seen in this city. He married Renata Blauel, a German tape engineer who he'd met at Air Studios in England when he started work on his Too Low for Zero album. The union lasted for four years and when she was gone with a £10 million settlement, it is believed, Elton decided that he had other interests in his life. His second marriage was of a different nature. Diversions aside, it's back to the cross, which by 1968 was changing dramatically. The Vietnam War brought US servicemen, ready cash and some nasty narcotics to the streets of the cross. But what really shocked conservative Sydney was the arrival of the tribal love rock musical in Orwell Street. Harry, we're in Orwell Street, King's Cross now, a fairly quiet street in the back of the cross. But in 1969, there was almost mayhem going on here. 10,000 people a week arrived in this street, all because of you. Yeah, and you know, the interesting thing is that nobody knew where this theatre was. It was owned in those days by MGM. We were looking for about a thousand seats to put here on, and this place was perfect. These streets were jammed with people. Um, I remember Patrick White was standing right here on this spot. He was a writer, Patrick White. Yes. Um, <laughs> since deceased, miserable bastard and um, talented. He stood here and watched all these people coming. And people came in taxis and buses and they walked. And this was the centre, the true centre of hippie land. But it was just wonderful and, and we brought out, I think, 10 or 12 black Americans for the show, including Marsha Hines, on this very spot. I used to go inside to the cast every night, assemble them, because Jimmy Sharman was the director, and I used to assemble them on stage before the show started and make this speech which said, I want you all to know that the smoking of marijuana is illegal and if I catch anybody smoking it, they will be instantly dismissed. And they could say, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then go into another home. But it was fabulous, it was very exciting. And I remember when we were doing the theatre up, I had Brian Thompson, who was just starting as a designer, well, there was nothing, I told him to decorate the foyer. And he did a wonderful hair, he had in the lobby there, he had H-A-I-R, then he decorated the box office mirrors. And two o'clock one morning, the caretaker phoned me and he said, oh mate, he says, I've got a problem down here. I said, what's the problem? He says, there's a Sheila down here feeding a kid off one of her tits. What do I do? I said, don't stop her, let her keep going, because she's got to finish painting that mirror by morning, because Brian Thompson will be furious if she doesn't. That is exactly what happened. But we had, we had a lot of fun. It must have been an interesting meeting of opposites. I mean, on one hand, you had the whole hippie community congregating here, but on the other hand, the mums and dads from suburbia coming in to get a little bit of the naughtiness that this sort of new, yeah, new you know, world was I bringing. I mean, here am I, 72 years old now, you should have seen me in my leather jackets with the fringes and my headband and my hair down here. I was the king of the, you know, of the intelligent Indian hippies, because yes. that's what hair was all about. We used to sell beads, we sold anything we could, but it was amazing and, and it was an exciting show. And hair changed Sydney. It changed it socially, it's changed it culturally. After that, stage shows were a different thing. Entertainment yeah. took on a different shade after hair, didn't it? Yeah, what hair did, hair built a bridge between the audience and the authors. People had never seen a show without scenery in as much as there were no velvet drapes in here. So you walked in and you saw the set. 
and the show. It was all there on site. The sound was appalling. Um, I think we had a 30 watt amplifier up in one of the box, 30 watts for the whole theatre. And, um, but it changed everything and there was no uh, seminal flow from here. There's never been a show since that took the culture and everything else on to the community the way here did. I mean, people in those days thought that grass was something that you mowed on a Saturday morning with a Victor lawnmower. Well, of the 750 people who auditioned for hair, a lot of them weren't actors. They were literally hippies. Off the but street. We cast it off the streets and it was... Jimmy Sharman was the director. He auditioned to black people in America with Sandra McKenzie. Yep. And, uh, and he... We just cast it and it was amazing. They could all sing, but when, when I think about people now, like John Waters, Reg Livermore, Reg Livermore was outrageous. He wouldn't do anything he was told, nothing. There was controversy everywhere around it and we aided the controversy. We, you know, people thought, we encouraged the church group to talk about rape in the street and incest in the churches in the aisles on a Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And so people thought that hair was the most wicked thing of all time and would wreck society. And um, it failed. It failed to wreck society. Hair was a very moral play, it in was. fact. Yeah. Very moral. It was against war. It was against ill treatment of young people, everything. And so the kids got it. They really got it first. And then it wasn't until a year after we'd opened that the adults really started to come. Yeah. So most of the people, were, were you getting people who really were sort of like straight people from the suburbs yeah. who were quite shocked by it? I mean, yeah, was that yeah. you, most uh, of your real early, early on, but it, that didn't... I, th I suppose the, the main audience, the square audience for here, didn't come probably until the second and third year, because it ran for five years. Yeah, I and, uh, but it was just amazing. But the big change that hair made was the attitude of those adults to the young people. That was really rewarding for our society and obviously rewarding for the kids. You had done so much before that. I mean, you were the man who twice brought the Rolling Stones to Australia. You toured Tom Jones and Herman's Hermits and everything. This must have been a change in your professional life too, that, that suddenly you, know, you were involved in a whole other area that you hadn't been before. Yeah, except that it was, in a funny way, a very formal show, you know. It had stage and orchestra and lights and all that stuff. So it was something that I saw and thought, this has got to happen. And Stefan Haag, who's long gone now, came back to Australia from a trip. He ran the Australian Opera. And he said, I've just seen a show in New York that you'll die. You've just got to bring it to Australia. And we did. And I think we were the second production in the world here. This was hailed as one of the, one of the great productions oh, it was. in, in the it world. Was. And what's this very important about it is that Jim Jim Sharman, who would then go on to do Superstar for you, and then do Superstar in London, and then help um, O'Brien create the Rocky the Rocky Horror Show. He was creating history here. He was. Sharman was 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 well, a bright Jimmy boy. Jimmy was very he? smart, and I. This is very funny. I mean, Jimmy was a pretty far out guy. On the opening night of Hair, I gave him as a gift an HMV walnut veneer television set. I went to his house a week later. He painted it bright yellow. I, I couldn't believe my eyes. I couldn't believe my eyes. But Jimmy says then and now, I think that was the most creative period probably of both of our lives. Mm. Brian too. But as a means of giving people a, a grounding for their career, of starting a whole bunch of careers, I can't think of anything else that was probably so influential in just giving so many people no, a great that, start. That's right, and that's what we did. The show was so free, and we had no constraints on anybody, on anybody, designers, singers, musicians, so people could come in and add whatever they had to offer, and that's what made here great. It may well have been the centre of hippiedom in the late 60s, but the ensuing decade saw the cross become as much a lifestyle as a location. While it could be hazardous to your health, it played a major role in nurturing the next generation of Australian rock stars.